Good morning from our world headquarters in New York. I'm Manis Cranny. And from our studios in London, I'm Danny Berger. Welcome to Bloomberg Brief. Let's set your agenda. The threat of U.S. government shutdown looms again as Moody's lowers the country's outlook, citing political polarization. Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley diverge on their bets for a Fed rate cut. Investors now await key inflation data due tomorrow. And Boeing versus Airbus, the two rivals are readying major orders in Dubai. We're live to the air show. A very good morning to you. Take your mind back 2018, the longest shutdown uh, at 35 days. That's what the market is grappling with, along with Moody's talking about the angst of politics and the fiscal largesse of the United States of America. Ten-year yields drop ever so slightly this morning. Do you want to be long treasuries in the event of a shutdown, in the event of an actual downgrade? There is downside risk. On the U.S. fiscal strength, it's no longer being fully offset by the sovereign's unique credit strengths. For the moment, no huge impact. CPI Tuesday, there's fear and loathing. The risk is the CPI comes in at three-tenths of one percent. That is the third month in a row of that snapping six months, uh, that six-month stretch of slowing price growth. Powell, of course, did tell us he will not hesitate to tighten again. Uh, there's a big divergence. Morgan Stanley, 300 basis points cut, kicking off in June of 2024 next year. Uh, and Goldman Sachs say they're closer to the Fed. They're hugging the Fed. So with all of that in mind, we look at dollar-yen. You are just inches away from a 33 year year low on dollar yen. So what we're looking at there is the hedge funds. They're the longest of the dollar since 2022. Your level on that is 151.95. That is 20 pips away. The oil market is down uh, ever so slightly this morning. You are just seeing again uh, a drop of over 12 percent in the past three weeks on the oil market. And you've Goldman Sachs cutting their Brent outlook to, by six dollars to 92 dollars. Danny, good morning. Good morning, Manus. Let's be honest, it's kind of a quiet calendar. We've got no auctions this week. So your risk event is tomorrow at 8.30 a.m. Eastern. It is the CPI. We'll get retail sales after that. The next day we'll have some Fed speak, but it is about CPI. U.S. futures and NASDAQ, both S&P, are down this morning two-tenths and a third of one percent this morning. But, Manus, they've been on a tear. U.S. stocks have been higher for nine out of the past 10 sessions. European indices, those move higher this morning, up 7 tenths of 1%. But Morgan Stanley says that you want to bet on the U.S. The growth will be stronger. It is a high bar for the rest of the world to meet. So you do have the scenario where we're pricing in more of a soft landing. But will the data back that up, Manus? We did get you, Mitch, numbers on Friday. And the soft data, for its part, does not necessarily back up the idea of a soft landing. You have in consumer expectations of inflation surging. Let me get to the chart for you, Manus. Because in part of the higher oil prices, they're facing some of the war risk premium. But there you go. It jumped. And now we're at a point where, again, inflation expectations, Manus, are at the highest in a decade. Well, this is everything that Jay Powell will not hesitate to react on. I wouldn't exactly call that. I mean, the debate is this, is whether we're becoming slightly on moored rather than on anchored in the inflation expectations. Mm. And that is going to be part of the debate. I mean, look at that divergence between Morgan Stanley at 300 basis points of a cut. I mean, yes. something bad has got to happen to get you there, Danny. But let's circle back to the risk of a shutdown in the United States of America. We're inching ever closer to a government shutdown in the coming five days amid Moody's threat of a potential credit downgrade. This despite the House Speaker Mike Johnson's compromise plan with officials from both parties hoping to avoid it. The Republicans in the House of Representatives and the Speaker of the House are just out there playing political theater. And if they keep this up, they're going to shut down the federal government. Really, this should start in the House. So let's see what they... I, I'm, I'm willing to let them go first and see what they come up with. And if it's a good faith approach, say let's do that and let's finish our appropriations bills. If the House sends us an irresponsible CR, then the risk of a government shutdown is pretty great. So it's really in the hands of Speaker Johnson and the House. Negotiations are ongoing right now, as I understand it. Uh, uh, very few members of Congress, uh, House or Senate, want to shut the government down. So uh, uh, minds tend to be focused in the 11th hour. Another month, another episode of D.C. shutdown drama. Joining us now is Peter Kinsella, global head of FX and precious metal strategy at Union Bank Iprive. Um, 
Peter, I'm sorry we have to go through this whole song and dance again. <laughs> oh, we all. It's, it's happened again. It's also met with that Moody's downgrading their outlook. At what point does it actually matter for the dollar, especially at some point will we say the shutdown drama and the fiscal episode in the U.S. is going to mean the peak of the dollar is in? Yeah, I think really it depends. If we do get a shutdown, it will be the length of the shutdown, right? Because that basically means a contraction in, in growth and, and consequently that we may begin to price in an earlier sort of Fed uh, rate cutting cycle. So it's really the length of any potential government shutdown is the issue. As I remember in 2018, we were shut down for roughly 35 days mm -hmm. at the time. Um, and then that obviously brought forward expectations of Fed and then a slightly weaker dollar. Um, so that's kind of where we are this time around. Um, I do find it interesting that Moody's, which has always been the laggard of the uh, the, the, uh, the rating agency, right. is, is now kind of getting out ahead of, in front of the pack, trying to call for another downgrade. Um, it is justified, however. Uh, we do see political dysfunction. Very, I would say, um, curious, uh, to put it politely, um, uh, fiscal debt metrics. Very diplomatic. So, yeah, yeah, one has to be these days. Um, uh, and so really, you know, I, I kind of make the analogy, it's, it's not the debt ceiling, it's the debt, right? We're getting to a situation where, you know, US, US debt dynamics are being questioned. And uh, that, that inevitably will put dollar, uh, pressure on the dollar, but not for some time yet, I fear. So where does the pinch point come, Peter? Good morning, excuse the alliteration. Um, because next year is not going to be a year of sobriety and probity, is it? It's an election year. Biden's not going to pull back. Um, they're going to have to print more bonds to pay the interest. So where is the pinch point? How does the market test the fiscal largesse? Well, we'll have to see what, what's happening with other currencies for a start and what's happening with other central banks, particularly those that, that appear to be relatively more solid and, uh, you know, more credit worthy. Um, you know, you're quite right. Next year is going to be pretty tricky. You know, governments tend to spend an awful lot of money during, um, uh, during election years. And we then have the, uh, the, the prospect of Donald Trump being re-elected as president. And, you know, he's not going to talk about fiscal probity uh, during his election campaign. No. If anything, we're likely to see, uh, you know, further talk about tax cuts and stimulus, etc. So, um, you know, we're, we're in a situation where for at least the next 12 to 18 months, I think we're, you know, any, any, you know, any hope of fiscal probity and prudence is really being thrown out the window, I'm afraid. I mean, so I was just thinking, you, you had a good stat today on hedge funds. I don't want to steal it, but to be honest, I actually just... I actually just can't remember it. What was it? Hedge funds? Long she, since She actually something? designed this chart to be further. It's 992. This is, how long, this is how long the market is of dollars. Yeah, yeah. The longest since 2022. The I mean, longest since late 2022. That was the stat you were actually looking for. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Manus. See, Peter, he, sa he saves me every day. This is, this is what Manus do does for me. You do have positioning racking up mm -hmm. for the dollar. Here you go. There's that chart for yeah. hedge funds. At what point do you say it's positioning that's going to move things. Are we long enough that that could be the factor? I would say we're not long enough yet. Um, I had a look at the aggregated IMM data recently, and I think the, the net long was about $8 billion, which while long, it's not that long compared to previous instances. And the second point is, well, what's the catalyst for you know, a material weakening in the dollar? Um, will we see it from CPI? It's unlikely, I would say, at this point, uh, just given that we're, we're looking at the month-on-month -month print, roughly 0.3% month-on-month. That's going to keep uh, Mr. Powell and, and company you know, pretty elevated vis-a-vis -vis the potential for a, a last or final rate hike. Personally, we think they're done um, as, as far as rate hiking is, is concerned. But really, were we to see a, a substantial weakening in, in, in CPI, that's in your catalyst mm. for potential weakening. So... Does, what does that mean for dollar yen? They'd breathe a sigh of relief at the Bank of Japan if that, if that was the case, wouldn't they? They'd go, Whew, we got away with that. I mean, we're looking at a 33 year. Yeah. Where were you in, what was number one in 1990 at this time when we were really there? I looked it up. Mariah Carey was number one in 1990. I was in my first job at NatWest Stockbrokers. So we haven't seen dollar yen since then. How relieved will the Bank of Japan be if, if, uh, if things roll over in the dollar, Peter? Um, I think they'd be happier to see a rolling over in the dollar than to have to listen to Mariah Carey again <laughs> coming into Christmas period. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with Mariah. Oh, come on. Um, in this Mariah Carey season, I you're going to disparage her. <laughs> I know. She's defrosting I as I have no good authority. Kinsella's um, been seen at a beach club dancing to other trashy pop tunes around the world. Uh, I, I, I'm sure that's a total lie. Um, <laughs> vis -vis, vis -vis the BOJ, look, I think there's two things. Um, the first is that if, if we look at what they, they did uh, two weeks ago, um, they've removed yield curve control. 
control, but effectively they're still, they still have a negative deposit rate. They've got ongoing QE in one form or another, and so hence you've seen the, the yen weakening somewhat. Um, we're getting closer to intervention territory, 152, 153, um, and so really I think that there's a, a pretty poor risk reward from being long dollar yen from current levels. Um, it wouldn't be compelling for me at these, uh, certainly at these levels. All right, Peter, I'm afraid we're going to have to end it there. Honestly, I fear for you this Christmas season if, if you tire of Mariah Carey. <laughs> Peter, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Peter Kinsella there of Union Banker Prebay. All right, Manis, let's get to some other the top stories that are trending on the terminal this morning. Republican Senator Tim Scott drops out. The South Carolina senator announced that he is ending his presidential campaign, saying he would immediately make an endorsement. Scott drew interest of prominent Wall Street executives, but failed to stand out in the race. Iceland is bracing for its most devastating volcanic eruption in 50 years, with a small fishing village at risk of being destroyed. When a different volcano erupted in 2010, 100,000 flights were cancelled, affecting more than 10 million people. Australia shipping operations are resuming after cyber attacks paralyzed four big ports since Friday, leaving tens of thousands of containers stranded. Port operator DP World says services won't return to a normal for another week. The disruptions at Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane and Fremantle comes amid a worker strike. Manus. And breaking news, uh, all government changes for Rishi Sunak, Suella well, Braverman is gone, but also Sunak named uh, the former UK Prime Minister making a comeback to the front bench as David Cameron as Foreign Secretary for the United Kingdom. Cameron replaces James Claverley, who has been appointed Home Secretary, and the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Exchequer Jeremy Hunt, will remain in his Position. Tough decisions by Rishi Sunak over the weekend. Coming up, more decisions in politics. President Biden's heading to the Apex Summit in San Francisco. Danny, later this week, a sit down with President Xi for the first time in more than a year. More on the story ahead. But first up next, we're live to the Dubai Air Show. Boeing strikes a major deal. We'll get the latest on the ground in Dubai next on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger in London. Manus Cranny is in New York. The Dubai Air Show takes flight today with some major deals. Along with more established names at this year's air show, one is attempting a new airline. One is a new airline, rather, attempting to disrupt the market. Riyadh Air, launched by Saudi Arabia's public investment fund, is in the process of building a fleet from scratch. Bloomberg's Guy Johnson spoke with Riyadh Air CEO Tony Douglas ahead of the launch. So we're very much on track and the reason why we're here at the Dubai Air Show today is to reveal our second livery. It's already gone viral on the internet and behind me is our first livery that we released earlier this year at the Paris Air Show. But yep. also just behind me, our first ever EV car partnership with Lucid. So all about sustainability right. as well. But in terms of the market, there's always challenges in aviation, but Riyadh, obviously capital city of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, fastest growing economy in the world at the moment, yep. and quite frankly, Guy, it needs better connectivity. Okay, so let's let's talk about how this is going to work. You, you, you've already ordered some aeroplanes from Boeing. We understand you're about to order some more narrow bodies from Boeing, but they're going to take a while to arrive. So you're going to have to, to, to launch, you're going to have to lease. When I talk to the lessors at the moment, they tell me that rates are going through the roof at the moment. Aeroplanes, if you can get them, are very expensive. How's that affecting the business model? Well, you've made a few assumptions in your question there, yep. and perhaps not all of them are the assumptions we're working to. First of all, we will probably not be leasing any aircraft. Okay. We will commit to a big fleet, uh, 72 787s already on order. What you are right about is in a number of weeks' time, we will announce a sizable order for narrow body aircraft. What we'll then have is a fleet that will allow us to connect to over 110 yep. cities by 2030. You, you are relying on Boeing delivery. How certain are you that that's going to happen? All of the major OEMs at the moment are having some significant difficulties. 
do, again, does the business model hold together if you don't get the aircraft you need? Well, I'm relying on Boeing for the 787s uh, delivery. That's the only order that I've publicly announced yep. at this stage. But what we've made quite clear to Boeing is we're special. And what does that mean? It's not that we're special in terms of personalities. We're a startup. Because we're a startup, the biggest one in over 30 years in this part of the world, we don't have a plan B. So if any OEM, doesn't matter whether they're an air framer yep. or anybody else, can't deliver on their commitments to us. It's not as if we can extend leases with aircraft because we currently don't have any of right. them as a startup. So we've made it quite clear that that is a fundamental characteristic of how we're contracting with them. But the important thing is this, everybody wants to be a part of this story right now for the reason that I've already mentioned. Yep. It's the biggest startup within the last 30 years. The Riyadh Air CEO, Tony Douglas, there speaking with Bloomberg's Guy Johnson on the ground at the Air Show. Guy, good to see you this morning. I mean, it's order after order after order. Great conversations. And Tony Douglas lays out the big risk if they don't deliver for him. Uh, China also said to be ending a long commercial freeze on critical overseas markets for Boeing. And you caught up with the Boeing commercial airline CEO, Stan yep. Deal. So what did he have to say? Well, OK, let's talk about what Stan Deal had to say. Stan's having a very busy morning um, and it's going to have a very busy week. He's here at the air show today. He's then going to get on a plane. He's going to go to San Francisco for the APEC uh, um, meeting. He wants to be there uh, for that summit between Xi and Biden, President Xi and President Biden, because the relationship between Boeing and China has been strained. It was strained after the MAX crashes. Politics has also extended that strain. And there is hope now amongst Boeing officials that we could be uh, seeing an easing of that strain. So this is what Stan Deal had to say to me earlier on this morning about recovering that relationship with China. Anytime there's dialogue, direct dialogue, that's a good thing. But. Uh... You know, we've been in China for 50 years now. We've been with our customers. Interestingly, last week, the 95th airplane, the MAX, that was on the ground came back. So they have all 95 airplanes flying. Uh, we're in the middle of preparing deliveries for the new MAXs. And uh, I'm optimistic about the discussions. Stan Deal talking to me a little bit earlier on. We're in the midst of the flying display now here in Dubai. So if you see jets rocketing over my shoulder and hear the noise, that's what's going on. Um, so Stan Deal there talking about the, the China deal, the, the China relationship and the potential for deals. And we do wonder whether or not we are going to see further deals later this week announced by China. Here in Dubai, we've just seen a $52 billion deal announced by Emirates for Boeing triple sevens it's a huge order guys back to you yeah yeah a, a, a huge order guy as you say 52 billion dollars what else are some of the deals that have stood out to you in day one so that's that's probably going to be one of the biggest danny but we could be seeing over a hundred billion dollars worth of deals placed on day one that would make this the biggest air show in 10 years we are waiting to see whether or not we get some big Airbus deals. We are anticipating, and we saw news over the, over the weekend about this, a huge deal coming from Turkish Airlines. Now, that is Turkey mounting a huge challenge to Emirates, to the Gulf carriers. With the kind of capacity that they are talking about ordering from Airbus, they would become a much bigger challenger to Emirates. So it's game on from the Turkish point of view. They want to expand Turkey as one of the regional hubs and we're potentially going to see that order a little bit later on today. And of course, hey, right. Manis, you see Guy yeah, standing out there in the sun. Do you remember what that's like to be in the I Dubai sun? I remember what that's like, but I just want everybody to know I've now got photographic evidence, which will go on Instagram a little bit later on. He thinks he's in a movie, doesn't he? Look at the quiff of her. I haven't seen him smile like that. I haven't seen Guy. Yeah. There we go. You there see? we go. That, there's movie star Guy. We Johnson. got him to do it live on our. Just hold that on. There, Guy. What do we see? Just get a wee bit. There you go. Live on our. Johnson with a sunglass. That is a Dennis breach. Live Instagramming. That is a fundamental <laughs> breach of Bloomberg style. Well, I'm going to report you. Guy Johnson. <laughs> oh, goodness. Guy, think, thank you very much. We're going to have much more. Paris. I've got a tie on. I'm going to wear the sunglasses. <laughs> You're looking cool. Looking smooth. Yeah.
might as, might as well. We'll, we'll uh, try to grab some sunglasses and join you next time, too, Guy. We're going to have more from him throughout the day. He's going to have interviews with Emirates CEO Tim Clark and Airbus Chief Commercial Officer and Head of Airbus International. Guy Johnson, the movie star, live in Dubai on Bloomberg. It's Bloomberg Brief, your Monday edition. Get you up and running. I'm in New York. I'm Manus Cranny with Danny Berger in London. Would you go to see the Marvels? That is the question, because apparently it needs a few more dollars on the opening weekend. $47 million. This is a low point, Danny, for the Marvels franchise. Did you go? Would you go? Do you like it? Superheroes? Uh, I mean, I went to go see I went to go see Barbie, but I don't think I'd what? go see anything else. I think what this ignores, though, is there was the actor strike. No one, no one could promote this thing. Like, of, of course, less people are going to go see it. Did I, did anyone know it was coming out? I didn't know it was coming out. I certainly didn't know it was coming out. I mean, I can remember I can remember back to two thousand and eight when they launched. I mean, they've made what have they made on this globally? Globally, this movie did one hundred and ten million bucks. There's been thirty three of these Marvel. I didn't realize that thirty three. Iron Man. Yeah, Do you remember that in 2008? Machine. Where were you in 2008? I think I was having a crisis in 2008, something to do with Lehman and <laughs> markets and the oh, implosion of my thing. life at Cantor Fitzgerald in 2008, just uh, from memory. You mean you weren't just relaxing at a movie theater watching Iron Man? I was just sitting back, <laughs> relaxed, going, look at this equity market. Yeah. I'll have a job in the morning. Life is easy. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to talk about US China. Uh, heading to San Francisco on Bloomberg Brief. Welcome back to Bloomberg Brief. I'm Manish Cranny in New York. And I'm Danny Berger in London. Here's what you need to know. The threat of a U.S. government shutdown looms again as Moody's lowers the country's outlook, citing political polarization. Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley diverge on their bets for a Fed rate cut. Investors now wait a key inflation data point due tomorrow. And Boeing versus Airbus, the two rivals are readying major orders in Dubai. We're live at the air show. Now, equity markets have had quite the run. We're up about 6% from the recent lows in October. U.S. markets have been higher, 9 out of the past 10, 10 sessions. We're taking a breather today, but historically that has not lasted. Usually we sell a bit, little bit in the morning and find some reason or another to rally. So both S&P and Nasdaq futures down more than a quarter of 1%. Morgan Stanley says they prefer the U.S. over EM. Goldman Sachs says we're too negative on profit warnings from companies. So the sell side seems cautiously optimistic. Meanwhile, in Europe, we're up about six tenths of one percent. Manus, we're going to talk about this in a little bit, but it's the same stock that's driving things. It's Novo Nordis. It's Wegovi. That weight loss medication cuts down risks of heart issues uh, for those patients that are taking it. So those shares, Manus, up about three percent or so this morning. Yeah, there's a nice bump in pharma. Have we moved to the last breath of 2023 of where perhaps greed overtakes fear, Danny. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why you're struggling to see a real movement down in terms of yields. Of course, Moody's has moved. Uh, the downside risks of the U.S. fiscal strength no longer fully offset the sovereign's unique credit strength. So no huge impact so far. Yields uh, dip ever so slightly. We move to Tuesday. We've got the fear and loathing of the CPI. We're looking for plus 0.3 percent for a third month. That will snap six-month stretch that we've had of slowing price growth. And don't forget, Fed Chair Powell says he won't hesitate to tighten again. Then you've got the di divorce between Morgan Stanley looking for 300 basis points of a cut kicking in June of next year. Goldman's uh, a little bit slower, 175 basis points. But uh, the issue is the fiscal warning there, the unsustainable trajectory. That's what Bill Dudley said. Dolly Yen, uh, you're 20 pips away from a 33-year low. 151.95 is where you want to be. Peter Kinsella was with us from Union Bancaire Privé. He says the downgrade uh, by Moody's is justifiable. Oil's managed to turn it around since we last spoke. We're down 12% as Goldman... 12% in three weeks. We're going into the fourth week break-off trend. As Goldman's downgrade, or they cut the 2024 view, view by 6 bucks to $92 a barrel. Higher supply, Brazil, Venezuela uh, and Nigeria. And don't forget those prompt spreads in the U.S., they've gone negative. Yeah, and, and man, it's on the point of, of Peter Kinsella talking to us about a shutdown, this idea that the downgrade is justifiable. He talked about the idea that, look, it's not the debt ceiling. 
it's the debt level, perhaps echoing some of what Bill Dudley said. For him, the only way that the dollar actually weakens with this is if you get the shutdown and it lasts for a long time. So if you want to ask, why isn't the market reacting more to the Moody's downgrade and the debt ceiling drama, man, it's because it actually has to happen for markets to move. At least that's a thought from Peter Kinsella. Yeah, and of course, with those shutdowns and with political angst or downgrades, uh, typically the bond market actually reacts quite positively. So uh, there's no yeah, irony true. lost in anybody. But of course, it is about the fiscal largesse, not just by Moody's, but by the former New York Fed president as well, Dudley, warning. Mm. And take your mind back, go and read Powell's speech on October the 19th, because it's a creed de cour to the fiscal largesse of the government administration at the moment. Let's talk about geopolitics, Danny, because the senior officials in Israel and the U.S. have suggested that talks are intensifying around securing a release of the Hamas-held hostages. The U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan spoke on Sunday. There are ongoing negotiations involving the Israelis, the Qataris, and we, the United States, are actively engaged in this as well because we want to make sure that we bring home those Americans who have been taken hostage as well as all of the other hostages. Well, the conflict has set off major political ramifications in the West, significant protests over the weekend, and a major cabinet reshuffle in the UK. The Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, has sacked his home secretary for defying his authority over the handling of a pro-Palestinian march and was accused of emboldening a far-right counter-protest which turned violent. Bobby Ghosh is our Bloomberg opinion columnist. The ramifications in the West we make a great deal of. You have a much more sober view. We're dealing with hostages. Uh, and you would say that the cultural and political confrontation that we're looking at here in the West is a distraction. It's a sideshow, man. I mean, it's not unimportant for those who are protesting. Uh, we are seeing that there are political costs uh, that uh, some politicians, well, about Breverman, the latest, yes. uh, are paying. But in the, in the greater scheme of things, the real story for me remains what's happening in Gaza and in Israel, where people are dying, um, and there's a prospect of many, many more people dying, and very little prospect of actual... We, we, we still... More than a month in, we still don't have a clear idea of how this ends. Israel has not yet properly communicated how it w sees this thing ending. Uh, and, of course, there's that whole business of the hostages yes. who remain unaccounted for. Uh, we've been hearing uh, officials from, from Israel, Qatar, and the United States say for weeks now that they are trying to get the hostages out. But beyond saying that, we've not seen very much uh, happen on the ground. I understand it's complicated. There's a war on, um, and Hamas is, is famously a, a, an unreliable negotiator. But the families of the hostages, for them, this tragedy just continues. Well, Bobby, the, there was also an Arab League meeting over the weekend. Is there any clear consensus from the Arab world in how to move forward? No, and I think a lot, in, a lot of people in the Arab world would have been very disappointed with that. There was a gathering. Um, there was a, a sort of bromide uh, criticism of Israel, condemnation of the attacks on Gaza, but no clear direction on what needs to happen next. There's no clear demand uh, for what the Arab leaders want to see. From the point of view of the, the world economy and certainly from the point of view from the West, uh, the, the biggest concern from that meeting would have been mm. whether or not the oil-producing Arab states, the GCC states, uh, were in a mood to impose some sort of a... Uh, an oil uh, shock like they did in the 1970s, early 1970s. Uh, that did not happen. No. There's a division among oil uh, producers on that subject. There are some oil producers which have liked to have seen some sort of a, a, a penalty uh, being imposed on the West for supporting Israel, but there's no consensus as yet. Was However, if these images keep coming out of Gaza, that could change. It's interesting that, that you touched on that Khaled al Fale with us at the New Economy Forum last week, yeah. being very, very clear with Stephanie Flanders that, you know, still the road to some kind of normalization uh, was the objective. It's interesting, Manuel, Emmanuel Macron told the BBC there's no justification for the bombing of Gaza and urged ceasefire. Germany's Olaf Schultz, of course, backing Israel's right to defend itself. So the splinters, the divisions in Europe are, are becoming ever more apparent. Uh, it's going to be a big week for Xi Biden. Do you think security will be solidly addressed at the Xi Biden summit? Or what do you think the, the upside is in terms of the world for this meeting? 
Well, the fact that they're meeting at all is very important. The two most important countries in the world, two biggest economies in the world. Just a few months ago, Xi Jinping was not taking Biden's calls. So the fact that the two of them are meeting is, is, is crucially important. Uh, two of the most powerful militaries in the world have not been communicating uh, with each other. That's a very, very unstable mm. and dangerous mm. situation. In a world where there are two live kinetic wars in Ukraine and in Israel, wars of enormous consequence uh, for the rest of the world and uh, for the global economy, it's not a good idea for the military leaders of, of the U.S. and China not to be speaking. So if the only thing that comes out of this meeting is a commitment to resume those conversations, I would take that as a great uh, move forward at this moment. I mean, there are important economic questions they need to address. Xi Jinping is coming to this meeting for the first time uh, in, in many years. A Chinese leader is coming to this meeting with a weaker hand, the, okay. the state of his economy being as bad as it is. So Biden hmm. uh, may not have the strongest hand himself. He's distracted by Ukraine, by uh, the prospect of a re-election, and now uh, with Israel. But Xi Jinping's hand is considerably weaker than it has been for many, many, many years. What, what, what does that actually mean in practice for Xi to enter this having a weaker hand? Well, he's counting on just the meeting itself uh, the fact that he's in San Francisco and he's being the center of attention, he's counting on that itself to give him a little bit of a boost back home. Remember, the, 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 you, know, you guys have co covered it extensively. The state of China's economy is, is very soft despite the, the recent quarter reports. There's a structural softness there. Mm -hmm. The real estate uh, uh, market is still in an extremely parlous state. And the, and the crucial thing is, of course, unemployment, youth unemployment, 20% when we last found out. And it's a very, very telling fact that China stopped reporting mm. that number. When, the, when a government right. stopped reporting a number as a number as important as that, it's got something to hide. And, and so this is, you know, Biden will be fully aware of this going into these uh, discussions with Xi Jinping. Um, but, you know, that's, that's where the weakness comes from and, and how much Biden wants to press on this given his own concerns, we shall see. Right, yeah, and we're just trying to guide Johnson about China maybe ending the freeze on, on Boeing orders, so the issue yeah. of, of trade and China relations with uh, U.S. companies is alive and well. Bobby, thank you so much for joining us on this Monday morning. That is Bobby Ghosh. Now, coming up, we're going to hear from Carlisle co-founder David Rubenstein on the resilience, he says, of private debt. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Brief, Danny Berger in London, Manus Cranny in New York. Shares of Novo Nordis are surging again after a key study backed the use of Wegovi, its blockbuster weight loss drug, to cut heart attacks and deaths in people with obesity and a history of heart disease. Joining us now for more on this is Bloomberg's Eric Fanner. Um, Eric, Manus and I caught up with the Novo Nordis CFO last week, and we were talking about this idea of, you know, when does this get approved by more insurers? When does this seem as something more than just to cut weight loss? Does this take us a step there? It does add another piece of the puzzle. I think that's been one of the big questions so far is, you know, how much is this drug a, a lifestyle drug, something that, you know, helps celebrities improve their appearance perhaps, and how much of it is a health benefit? So this does show that there is a health benefit beyond independent of just losing weight, which obviously has benefits of its own. This shows a heart benefit um, that over time, you know, could be really beneficial. How much, how much it helps, that's still a question, mm. of course. So where are, I mean, look, there, there's going to be more of these drugs come to market. There's going to be competition on pricing. So where does Novo Nordisk, they keep surging, even though there's this competitive threat from Eli Lilly? Yeah, that's right. There's the new drug, uh, Munjaro, from Eli Lilly that was just approved as well for weight loss. Um, you've got a lot of other projects. Pfizer has a, a, a project in the works here that's, that's coming you know, down the road. Um, we even had AstraZeneca last week um, talking or doing a deal for a, a, a potential weight loss pill um, that would be similar to these and taken in oral form, which would make it a lot easier. Now, that one's way down the road. But obviously, there's a lot of people trying to get in on this race. They see the, uh, the potential size of the market. You know, which some analysts have put at potentially even um, 100 billion, which would you know be a huge market and even a lot bigger than it is 
at, at the moment taking shape. So I think that's what you know draws so many people into it. That's why you you know potentially you've got room for more than one or even two or three players. Um, but you know just how big it is uh, is obviously big uncertain still. Right. I mean, a huge addressable market. Eric, thank you so much for joining us. That is Bloomberg's Eric Fanner. All right, let's turn to the world of private capital. Funds managed by the biggest firms continue to highlight alternative asset outperformance versus public assets. Is it just, though, covering up volatility? Well, Carlisle co-founder David Rubenstein spoke to Bloomberg's Francine Lacqua earlier this morning. Well, private equity um, is not doing as many deals as it did a few years ago. The cost of capital is higher, obviously, but it's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is that buyers have bought things over the last couple of years thinking that they would sell them at certain multiples of return. And then sellers, uh, I mean, I say sellers now, they turn it to be sellers, the buyers that were the buyers, they bought these things. Now they want to sell them. When they sell them, they want to get a certain rate of return. But they're not likely to get that because the new buyers are saying we can't pay that much because the economy is slowing down and interest rates are higher. And so there's also a fear that you could go into a recession in the United States. And if so, nobody wants to buy into a recession. So I'd say the sellers are here, the buyers are here. There's a gap of 15 percent or so between the bid and ask. And that's why deals are not getting done right now. So, David, what happens? Who's, who's going to budge first, right? At some point, these two mismatches will have to come together. Yes, the economy uh, always works out in some way that, there's a compromise between the two. But I would say right now people are waiting to see whether the Fed is going to increase interest rates again. And if they do not, whether they're going to begin to cut. And if they do, then I think people will feel a little bit more emboldened. Uh, one of the issues we have in the United States is, is there going to be a recession or not? Uh, right now, I think the consensus is that there will not be a recession. But, you know, those consensus, consensus change from time to time. So I don't know. Yeah, but, and we're looking at, are you feeling actually any, any stress out there in, in the U.S.? We're looking at lending. I mean, there are these pockets actually of concern in the U.S. economy. There's always con pockets of concern. Right now, we're probably going to grow this year at 1.7%. So it's not recession-like numbers, yep. but it's not 2 or 3%. I think the U.S. economy is still trying to figure out what the Fed is going to do. Is the Fed going to yeah. cut or not? And when is the Fed going to cut? And one of the issues that hasn't been talked about very much is the Fed probably is going to find it difficult to cut next year before the election. Because if the Fed were to cut interest rates before the election, obviously it'll be accused of helping uh, the Democrats, and that would be very unpopular with the Republicans. So I suspect the Fed, to avoid poli political criticism, will probably wait to do any cutting until after the election. Yeah, but at the same time, we also, if we have inflation at 4 percent, and it gets stuck at 4 percent, it could be very painful for them to get inflation from 4 to 2 percent. Well, getting from four to two is not easy. It's easier to go from eight to four than four to two. Um, two is what we had for 25 years, but it's not likely we're going to get down there so quickly. So the Fed has been very consistent in saying we've got to get to two percent. They have said a couple of times, well, two percent within range of two percent or, or, or close to two percent. So it may not have to actually hit two percent before they actually begin to cut. But it, it can't be three or four percent. They made it clear they didn't want to go to two percent. David, where do you see deals in private equity? Again, the, the, you know, the private equity space is changing also because of, of the lack of companies to buy. So you have a lot of money chasing the same assets. Well, there are always going to be deals. People are always going to do some deals. There are deals that are going to be done in uh, technology, for sure. That's a very hot area. Uh, a lot of op opportunity is, is now available in, let's say, uh, fin fintech and financial services. Um, athletics, sports-related thing is also seeing a lot of activity. So I think there will be activity. I just think the prices that the buyers are going to pay is lower than what the sellers really want. Now, that gap is about 15 percent, and it'll probably close, but not for a while. And that's across the board in the U.S., in Europe, or valuations in Europe have always been a bit cheaper, so I wonder whether it's easier well, to Well, there's still a gap there. here. I think here, there's some countries in Europe are in recession, in effect, and so I think many people are more nervous about it than before, but I do think there is equity available, uh, and there is debt available for deals when the pricing gets closer to where people on both sides want to do it. I think their fundraising is more complicated now. Mm -hmm. Fundraising for new private equity funds is more challenging than it was a couple years ago because of the uh, called the denominator problem. They, they, the groups that have money have less to give out because they, their overall corpus has sh shrunk a bit. But there's still money there. People find good deals at a good price. Th there, there'll be money available. Great conversation there, David Rubenstein in the studio with Francine Lacroix in London. Of course, Danny, it's interesting that he talks about the inability or perhaps the the issues around cutting rates aggressively next year in an election year. Therefore, 
they would be accused of being partisan, of being pro mm. the Democrats. And then you look at Goldman's versus Morgan Stanley. I mean, they, they are miles apart in, in, in terms of where they are for their rate cut start and end point. It, it, it's true. I mean, Ellen Zetner and team over at Morgan Stanley think that policy is going to end about 2.3 percent. Uh, Goldman Sachs, it's something closer to three and a half percent. I mean, those are those are very those are very different. And it's something that the market at the moment more citing on Morgan Stanley. But the Fed, let's be honest, Powell was hawkish last week. He still says higher for longer. Well, one thing that you've got to get this housing market moving. Uh, could you imagine a 300 basis point cut? What would that do? I'd be in the market, Danny. I'd be in like Flynn Ooh. with a mortgage. I'd have a credit <laughs> history then. I'd have 12 months of credit history. I'd maybe even get a mortgage. Wow, I'm coming over your place then. I hope you have an extra bedroom for me, Manus. Always. <laughs> you just need to book that ticket and get here. By the way, Bill Dudley, uh, over the former New York pre uh, uh, Fed president, we are on an unjustifiable trajectory for the fiscal warning. They're coming hard and fast. Coming up on the show, we're going to close it out. Monday morning, let's see what we've got. Market moving events for the week. CPI uh, is the big one on Tuesday. We'll run you through your agenda right here on Bloomberg Brief. Look at that. The city of New York never sleeps. This is Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger in London. Manus Cranny is in New York. Now let's take a look at what's ahead this week. In the U.S., we're going to get the latest read on inflation on Tuesday, then PPI and retail sales on Wednesday, and then another round of jobless claims on Thursday. Here in Europe, Eurozone GDP comes on Tuesday, UK CPI on Wednesday, and Eurozone CPI on Friday. Plus, ECB President Lagarde will be speaking on Tuesday and Friday. Then finally, we're going to get the retail sector round Wrapping up the earnings seasons, there are results from Home Depot, Target, Walmart, and Macy's throughout the week. Now, Manis, there was an interview last week on a different TV station, which shall not be named, but from Target, saying that consumers are pulling back their spending. They're even pulling back on groceries. Um, is that because everyone's trying to save or just is everyone already on Ozempic? <laughs> OK, <laughs> well, we won't go down the Ozempic <laughs> road. You're just tempting me there. I know you are. But um, I am. <laughs> well, the rich are, are pulling back in terms of expensive watches. Richemont, we saw their, their numbers down. Walmart is going to be interesting, Danny. We're expecting uh, Walmart to say that their sales have dropped by nearly 50 percent versus last year. That's t yeah, there you, there you are. I was wondering you were hiding behind that screen. So they expect sales <laughs> to drop to 4%. So that's less than half they were last year. I was in a store which will remain nameless and they already mm -hmm. had their Black Friday. I was trying on a couple of suits because my brother said my suits were a bit tardy. He said, you look, he said, you look a bit oh. slack. Yeah, he did. So 30% off. 30% okay. off already uh, on, a particular, on a particular brand of suits in a particular store. So there you go. There's Ma already Manus, price cuts. I'm, I'm jealous. I'm jealous of the New York deals. I miss them. And I saw they opened a Wegmans in New York City, in Manhattan. If you don't know what it is, Manis, you got to get over there. I expect your next Instagram video to be about the glory of American Wegmans and grocery stores. I don't know how to follow that because I don't even know what they do. There's a lot of things <laughs> in America I don't oh. know an awful lot about. <laughs> dollar yen. I know a thing or two about that. A little bit of dollar yen. That's you true. can <laughs> smell the 33-year low coming. Yeah. I mean, just, just an inch away from 152. <laughs> the last time we were here, Manus, the MOF, they were intervening. Is that intervention risk alive and well? That's it for us on Bloomberg Brief. Surveillance is up ahead.